This is, the, this is the time of graduations. Um, it is a very busy time for parents and for grandparents and for, yes, the graduates. I have heard a lot of commencement speeches. I have given quite a few commencement speeches. I don't remember any of them. <laughs> and so I hold out no hopes that today will be a life-changing thing that you carry with you in your heart with a transcript in your wallet. I, I, I get that. But I, to me, it's an exciting time because it's a time of change. Some of our graduates will be going on to trade and technical schools. Some will go off to university. Some will go into the military. Some will donate a year or two of their time to charitable organizations such as uh, missionary work or Peace Corps or the like. But the fact is, everybody will be changed and all will be changed. And that's what makes this a wonderful time and also a very, very frightening time for everybody involved. Our job as parents is to get our children to the point where they can live without us. We may not like that, but it's true. And I can tell you as a parent and now a grandparent, that there is a universal feeling among parents that if they're good parents, you know, there are those that, you know, throw a party because you leave, but we're not going to talk about those, all right? Most parents instead have this weird feeling as they watch you transition that they have not yet said enough, taught enough, done enough, and they are right. Because we cannot fully prepare a person, another individual, to live their life. All we can do is give them principles, ideals, ethics, and beliefs that can serve as guardrails while they create their own life. God did not make a Patrick 2.0 or 3.0 with son and grandsons. and No, no, he makes different people. It's what he does. But everybody needs guardrails. And that's what parents hope that they put out there for you. In scripture, whenever a great change was to take place, a trusted friend or a leader would give a charge to those who are about to face that change. Before we look at those charges, I want to remind you of something that you might not have known before. You might ask how to remind you of that. That's ah, kind of a, that's a, it's a linguistic issue, isn't it? Something in us understands the power of choice, but we never really discuss it as much as we should. I learned the very, really, most about the power of choice by reading Viktor Frankl's story, A Man's Search for Meaning. If you've not read it, I recommend that you do. It's only about 100 pages long. He was an eminent professor of psychiatry at the University of Vienna, and then the Nazis came. He was a Jew. His family were Jews. Long story, a very, very, very important story, but he was the only one that survived the camp, and not his wife, not his children, no one else. Uh, he was not allowed to practice as a, as a physician or as a psychiatrist, but rather he dug trenches with his feet wrapped in rags in the winter. He did whatever the work camps made them do. But as a man of science, he could not help but notice that some people lived and some people died and some people kept living when they probably should have died. And he began to study why people lived. He, it boiled, boiled down to, they had a choice. They made a choice. He asked some, how can you drink out of the muddy puddle that you can even see oil slicks and such on it? How can you do that? And they looked at him and they said, we choose to look at it as a light hits it and say, we're drinking rainbows. And their power of choice, the way they chose to respond to what was happening is what made them survive. They didn't thrive. Nobody thrived in the camps, but they survived long enough to tell their story. The power to choose, if I can get nothing else into your head today, Get this, the power to choose is the only thing you own. That's it. Everything else, everything else you have can be taken from you by one accident, one virus, one lawsuit, one war. But regardless, regardless of what happens to you, 
you have the power to choose how to respond. You have the power to choose who you will be in that circumstance. How, will you act or will you react? And I would beg of you one thing today. Never give the power to choose to anybody else. Let them have their power to choose. But don't give away your power to choose. Don't let them make your decisions. We all know that sometimes you can ask people, where do you want to eat? And they'll say, I don't care. And they really do. (laughs) I'm not talking about minor things like that. But however, if you don't want to eat at a certain place, don't eat there. Don't let the crowd decide for you. Because if you let them start deciding the small things, they begin to decide the larger things. And the next thing you know, you have no identity. You are a gray blob in the mob. You're not making decisions on your own. Now, if you're a teenager right now, uh, I don't speak against teenagers. I think they're fantastic. I love them. Uh, I would love to go back and do mine all again, but not do anything that I did before. Uh, I've heard people say if they could live their life again, they wouldn't change a thing. And I think that's the definition of being a slow learner. You need to learn from your mistakes and change things. But if you're a teenager, you may feel like you've never really had a free choice. Parents chose for you. Teachers chose for you. You might believe, and I've heard the high school graduation and the college graduation Uh, speeches where they they say now it's our world and now we get to do and now no you don't no you don't I love the optimism but that never happens there will always be people situation and circumstances that limit you and that place demands upon you all you have is the power to choose how you will respond and who you will be in that circumstance. The ultimate example of this would be Jesus. Hanging on a cross. He's limited. He was limited. His freedom was gone. His life was ebbing. And yet on the cross. He chose to be Jesus. He arranged for the care of his mother. He forgave the sins. Of all of us. There is no question. That he was feeling all of the pain. And all of the humiliation. Because he was Indeed, human in a human body, even though he was God. But he chose to remember others. He chose to still love them. He acted. He did not just react. If you just react, you give away your humanity and you become a pinball. That all you do is react to whatever stimuli is around you. Acting You choose how to respond if you choose to respond at all. Take care that once free from your choice, the choices your parents once made for you, that you do not fall into the trap of making the choices other people are actually making for you. Peer pressure often looks like freedom. Now you're free. Let's do this. Let's be this, take this, do that, be here, like this. But God wants sons and daughters. Satan wants cattle. Don't be cattle. Don't be one of the herd. Be the incredibly detailed, one at a time, never seen before or will be seen again, individual in the universe. We can take the DNA from any male and any female and make 10 to the 128th power different humans, no twins, no copies. And yet in the entire universe, it is believed that there are no more than 10 to the 62nd power atoms, which means you are quadrillions of times more unique than the universe in which you live. Do not let the people around you take that from you. And make you into what they want you to be. Don't let them whittle you down. From a son or a daughter of God. To just another cow in the herd. I won't preach at you. But let's do a series of charges. And I want to start these charges in a very strange place to start charges. 
Never heard anybody else go there before. And that's not why I did it. I did it because I chose to think about the passions that hit young folk. Old folk have passions too. It's just that they become so skeptical and have no energy. There's no reason for them to have the passions. Young people have passions and they have a lack of the skepticism and they have the energy. Okay. So let's start with this. Solomon 8, 4. The Song of Solomon. Most of us know it as, as a beautiful poet, uh, poem of erotic love. And it is. And yes, it's in the Bible. Who knew? You can read that, by the way. Just don't use the same compliments. They worked back then. They're not so good now. You know, just, just to say that someone's uh, nose is, is, is like Mount Hermon. They liked a substantial nose. Uh, I, that's all I can say. And that your hair is like a bunch of goats coming off of a... Doesn't work well, but you get the point as you go through. But in Song of Solomon 8, 4, the scripture says, Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. In other words, be really careful who you give your heart to. And be very careful what you give your heart to. It can be a person. It can be a series of people. It can be a movement. It can be a mission, an idea, politics, whatever. Be really careful who you give your heart to. You may feel, and there are those who, who feel no need to be connected, actually. Uh, they don't, as uh, I had one person tell me, they said, we're grapes, not dates. We go out in groups. You know, I have no, in they had no interest in pairing up. But you may be one of those people who has a deep need to be loved to be accepted, and to be special to a person. That's fine too. Just be careful. Young men, you are given actually three chapters by Solomon and uh, Proverbs chapters 5, 6, and 7 warning you how somebody can take advantage of you if you feel the need to be accepted and loved and special. And it's really easy to do, by the way. And it's still the same way people do it today. So those chapters are pretty important. And that perhaps this is a good time to remind you that the notes for this with the scriptures are in the description of the video. Uh, they are there in English and Spanish. And we are working now pretty close to having them in a host of other languages as well. So they're there for you. Hold love to be a special thing. Wait and take care. And by the way, if somebody is not treating you amazingly well, understand this. This is them on their best behavior. This is them courting. It will not get better when you marry or when you decide to move in together or however you choose to push this forward. You need to understand something. If this is them during the wooing period, it does not get better. And no matter how much you love them, you cannot love them into change. Be careful. Love is powerful. Like guns, fast cars, or nuclear energy. It's really good if it's used correctly. It's really horrible if it is not. And the next thing is this. I don't want to take away any of your joy. I want you to be joyful. I want you to laugh like you're crazy. I want you to dance. I want you to do all of that. But remember Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as if working for the Lord and not for human masters. Excellence matters. Now, not everybody's going to have a 4.0. And in America, I have to explain this because the other countries don't have this. 4.0 means perfect a perfect score. But in America, there are people that have 4.2 and 4.4. And that makes zero sense to me. But what that means is that they did straight A's and then they did the extra work, blowing the curve for everybody behind them. I'm not necessarily talking about that because frankly, not everybody can be 4.0. I was not, uh, and I, I'm not asking for that, but I'm saying you apply what you've got and you do it the best you can. Be excellent. Be excellent when you mow the lawn. Excellent when you make the bed. Excellent when you choose what to eat. Strive for doing this as unto the Lord. If your mom and dad were to ever go to a grocery store, get the, the trolley, the cart out, and then say, before they left, before they started, pray, God, this is your money, this is your body, this is your world. Give me wisdom as I place things in the cart. That would change the cart. Do that with everything. This is your life. I belong to you. 
as I enter this class, as I go on this date, as I go see movies with my friends. Help me to be excellent, for I'm doing this for you. Work the Lord into your life, in other words, into your enjoyments. God is not upset when you're happy. It's God that designed the bee to dance. It's God that designed giraffes for no particular reason. It's, I'm not opposed to giraffes. It's just that we don't necessarily need them. But you can almost see God making them just going, wait a minute. There you go. That's more interesting. And he did that with a lot. He, he made funny things. He made beautiful things. You're allowed to have fun and enjoy beauty. And, and in fact, not only allowed, I would encourage you to. But keep the Lord in mind. You see, you're out of your parents' house. But you are not out of his sight. He loves you. That's good news. He wants you to acknowledge him and love you back. Because that's what you were created to do. You'll feel better. You'll do better. You'll be more excellent if you keep God in mind. Then James chapter 1 verse 12. There's always this. You got to talk about it. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Because having stood the test. That person will receive the crown of life. That the Lord has promised to those who love him. Good things don't come easy as a rule. This is why you don't find people who are missionaries winning the lottery. It also could be that they don't play it. But the fact is, whether you play it or not, the odds of you winning it are about the same. Work on that, math people. (laughs) You don't see that because good things don't come easy. Good things come through trial. When the world throws bricks at you, which it will, regardless of what you choose. Even if you choose poorly, the world will throw bricks at you. The world eats its own. You stay who you are, who you were created to be. Take it and do not respond in kind because that makes you more and more a son and daughter of light and not one of the great darkness. And then where everybody expects you to go whenever you talk about a charge. I'm going to go to Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Right before they enter the land, Joshua gives them a charge. Actually, they've entered the land, they've taken the land, but they've not held the land. And he gives them a charge as he is, as he is about to die. He says, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable for you, then choose. Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You may think... That one day you will get to the point where you're ready to choose. And that is a lie. You've already chosen. You've chosen not to choose. Make your choice. Make your identity. This is who we are. This is what we do. Recently I was in a hospital again. It was an incredibly uncomfortable time. Won't give you the details because this isn't about me. But when the nurses came in, I made sure that... They had a Christian who spoke well to them, even when they were being persecutors of me. (laughs) I'm sure that some of those things had health benefits. Others may have been purely entertainment. But regardless, you know, they have a horrible job. It's a terrible job. And I decided before I went in, I'm going to be the best patient they've got. I'm going to be the the kindest one that they've got. I'll ask questions and I'll question treatment. But I will never question their sincerity or their desire to do well. And I will always say thank you. And it made a difference. Now, there's always a back end to that. They got to where they would come in and share their life story with me. And I wasn't really ready to hear it, but I'd set it up. Make your decision to do the right thing before the wrong thing is an option. Make your decision to do the right thing before the wrong thing is an option. Therefore... 
when an opportunity arises, as it always will, to be unfaithful to someone you love, to be unfaithful to God, to be unfaithful to yourself, to be unfaithful to the ethics and morality which you know in your heart you should be faithful to, you will not even be tempted because you've already decided. We had a snowstorm, a blizzard that hit, and all the churches in, in our town were shut. And even were on the radio saying, this church, this church, this church. My dad would not shut a church on a Sunday. Even if Jesus came back, he'd ask him, could you hold that thought? Because it was just, he was very much structure. And so he said, we got it. And it took us forever to get there. We slipped and slid all over the place. But we got there. We were the only ones there for the longest time until the door opened. And here, and then I'm just going to call him Uncle Joe an old man that lived with his daughter and her husband, and they actually didn't like him much, but they had to take care of him. And so he just, he had a miserable life, but he was there every Sunday, and he came in, and he was literally, there was snow and ice caked on his trousers from mid-thigh down. So we brought over the little space heater, and we're trying to rub him down and such, and I remember my father looked at him and said, Uncle Joe, why did you decide to come today? And he said, I didn't. Of course, I'm a wee kid. I'm thinking, well, he's now demented. He's gone. But then he finished his his thought. He said, I became a Christian. I forget how many years before. And he said, I decided then that I would be in worship every time I could. So I didn't decide this morning. I decided then. And I remembered it. I was about eight, nine years old. But I remembered, make the decision before the option to do wrong shows up. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. You'll like this one. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Don't accept the judgments of the world. They say this is good, this is bad, this is up, this is down, this is trending, this is not. Don't accept that. But also don't accept it whenever people look at you and go, oh, well, you're just young. Don't let anyone look down upon you because you're young. I have had the blessing over the years of speaking at hundreds of youth rallies and gatherings. I am absolutely madly impressed with youth. They pray better than I pray. They sing better than I sing. Not just note-wise, but actually you can tell they mean it. It's in their heart. And whenever they have a passion for something, they go. They do it. And they do it. Sometimes we'll look at that and say, I don't think. I had a parent once come to us whenever we lived in Michigan and worked with the church there. And they said, we need you to talk to our daughter. And I said, what's going on? And they said, she wants to go to Kenya for the summer to work at a Christian school there. And I said, and what's the problem? And they said, well, it's, it's dangerous. I said, you live in Detroit. I'm not, you know, this is the only place I've ever lived where people say, cover me, I'm going for milk. This, this, I said, you, we do not protect our children from danger, physical danger. We protect them from moral and spiritual danger. We let them do what their passion, if it is for God, drives them to do. They weren't entirely happy, but the daughter did go and they were happy after. That it, All my stories don't have happy endings, but that one did. So I really wanted to bring that one up. But don't let anybody look down upon you because you're young. I don't understand older men who marry young women. Why? Or younger women to marry the older men. Because younger people have more energy. They have more dreams. They have more want to get out and do things. I don't have those. I'm happy just doing this work. Be young while you're young. And don't rush it. Don't forget the stories you've been told. 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 19. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you. So that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. Holding on to faith. And a good conscience, which some have rejected and so made shipwreck with regard to the faith. Well, let's leave off the last phrase there and just talk about the first part of that. The Bible stories you've been taught have been out there for between 3,500 and 2,000 years. They've been there for a reason. 
They survive for a reason. Don't forget them. Remind yourself of them. If it's too big a thing to say remind yourself of all of them, make a plan to read the Gospels at least once a year. It really won't take long. And I know that reading, whenever, if you're off in university, in the military or the like, you don't have much time. I get that. But we have so many options now. Your Kindle can read it to you. You can have audio books. You can read it. And they're short books. Just really, in your Bible, pull out the Gospels and, and, and put them all together. They don't take up very many pages. But remember the stories. And keep spiritual goals in mind. Because if you do, they will transform your earthly goals into something more wonderful than you'd ever hoped for yourself. 1 Timothy, again, chapter 6, 11 through 14. But you, man of God, also applies to you ladies. It was a generic term at the time. Flee from all of this. Pursue righteousness. Chase it. Chase righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. That's why we, this is a book to a young person. They have the energy to chase. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Jesus Christ who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you, keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chase the good. Don't wait for it to come to you. It won't. Chase righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and endurance. Live for something higher and bigger than yourself. Because you know you. We all know ourselves. We're faulty. We have flaws. We have serious issues. If you're the biggest thing you live for, your God is a very tarnished God. So, is it alright to earn money? Yes, but money for what? Is it alright to seek out a certain job? Yes, job for what? What are you going to do with this to pursue godliness, righteousness, peace, love, gentleness, endurance. After Joshua, one of the best known charges comes from Paul to Timothy. It was read to you earlier by our sister Barb. As an older man facing death and undergoing serious deprivation, he knew that the life facing Timothy, if Timothy was going to follow him at all, was going to be a very, very difficult one. And you heard the charge in the presence of God and Christ Jesus. You, know, you can't get more serious than this. Who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing in his kingdom. I give you this charge. Preach the word. I'll stop there. Because some of you are going. I don't want to be a preacher. I don't either. I get it. But remember the words attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel at all times. When necessary. Use words. You can preach with your life. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. That is making your choices before the event occurs. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. So when we correct and rebuke, we also encourage. We never throw away anybody. Even if we disagree with them, we work with them. With great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. In other words, take it. Do the work of an evangelist. Evangelist means the bringer of good news. Doesn't mean what we normally think it means. It just means be the person that brings good news, peace. When you walk into the room, let the temperature of the room cool and everybody's going, because you're there. Why? Because you're facing a world that has given up on truth and, in fact, considers truth to be an obstacle and they're very open about it. Isaiah chapter 59. Verses 14 through 16 says truth has fallen in the street and nobody will get up to help it. And those who speak the truth become an enemy. Yeah, be ready. Be ready. Don't bow. Don't duck. Take it. Stand there. Move forward and speak the truth again. Speak in love, but speak the truth about biological reality. Speak the truth 
about social reality, the value of marriage, the value of faithfulness, the value of hard work, the value of benevolence and charity. Don't be fearful. Refuse to be fearful. For the Christian, fear is not an option. And love is never optional. Don't be the person filming what is going on. Those lifting up phones are just part of a herd. Be the child of God who steps in, who risks your life, risks your reputation to save another person. Live for something bigger than yourself and you will be a child of light. You see, that's what the good Samaritan did. That's why we call him good. So be good. Don't be a cow. Be a son or a daughter of the most high God because that's what you were created to be. We'll never see you again. This is the only you this universe will ever see. So, Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Everything you need will be given to you. That was his promise to you. It remains his promise to you. Now it's time, in this time of vast change, to choose to make promises to him. We're all rooting for you. We believe in you because we believe in the one who made you. Go in peace.